Uh, well, you know, John, we really appreciate you being here today. Um, can you take us back to really kind of where it all began um, in the early 90s and what it was like uh, working on the first season uh, of The Real World? Um, did you imagine that it would essentially create an entire new television genre that has essentially been the, the new normal the world over since? Yeah, I mean, it was, we really um, didn't know as much as we thought we knew. We had this idea that if you put seven people together from different backgrounds who normally wouldn't live together, you'd get conflict. And out of that conflict would come growth. And that growth would be our story arc. But we naively, you know, I think we had uh, two directors, a uh, couple cameras, you know, we naively thought at the same time, you know, if they said they were going to go somewhere, they'd actually go there and not oversleep. So just the, the technology of, of and, and the number of people to document um, everyday lives is tough. You know, our idea always was that we were going to do something that up to that time had been pretty much sort of documentary, where you, te you tell the story that you find. We were creating the story in a way by choosing those seven individuals. Um, that choice that we made would determine potentially where story might go. Um, and then uh, we wanted to story edit it like a scripted show in terms of what's our A and B story. And, uh, and of course, we really wanted romance. <laughs> and we hoped we would have one that first season, but I think the closest we got to was a flirtation and, and we had to give that flirtation a lot of help in the edit room between Eric, the uh, uh, good looking uh, model from New Jersey and Julie, the young dancer from Alabama. Yeah, that romance is, is clearly a central theme and that's probably what made it such a success. And you know, so many of the reality television series and documentaries have that as the central theme. Um, clearly the reality TV format uh, is becoming more democratized and accessible. Um, we saw, you know, today um, with, with Jeff's presentation uh, as Reality TV 2.0, um, it certainly seems to be a lot more accessible now in a live streaming mobile first UGC format. Um, apps like The League, for example, they even have a tune in uh, time period between Sunday and Wednesday night. Um, that's a speed dating session. Um, and then the one to many environments like uh, on East Meets East. Um, and across the meet groups, five app portfolio, uh, they have the games mentioned that are speed dating games like next date, blind date, date night. Um, is it fair to say that we really are entering into a new era of reality TV? Well, I think we certainly, um, uh, there's a new platform, uh, uh, the platform that online dating uses that allows more of a participation uh, more of an interaction, um, still gives you that voyeuristic experience that reality TV has. To linearly where as the producer, I'm sort of figuring out sort of from all this stuff that I have, all this material, this is the stories I'm gonna edit together and present to you in, in what you're describing on these dating sites. Um, you're sort of following the story you want to follow and um, you're taking, it's, it's not being as constructed. Um, so in some ways that could be exciting. In other ways, it might be less interesting um, because you know all those hours that we take to put together the show, whether it's us or you know on a real world or Mike Fleiss with The Bachelor, they're, they're applying sort of what we've learned over hundreds of years how you tell a story to engage people. Yeah, and then that, that's the kind of uh, format that is so different and, and new and interesting. And um, if you look at, I think what really makes it um, so engaging is um, the, the real time um, interaction that you would have and with the streamer or the host as it were, um, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, message boards or Twitter or, or following up or maybe Instagram. Um, with the the cast members on a particular show, but I think with, uh, with the one to many type of environment, you have that uh, gifting that encourages a sort of reaction, and emotion is really what's driving it. Um, I, I think that that's often a mistake um, that some make that want to liken 
this type of a format to um, a, a particular content category. Certainly we see that with shows, um, but when you see that with a particular um, talent, it's quite interesting because you're really getting that personality and it, it would probably stand to reason that everyone um, in reality television that's on camera is on camera for a reason because they have a personality and because they're they're easy on the eyes. Yeah, and then the question is, are they being themselves or are they giving you a performance of themselves? Uh, Paris Hilton, you know, in her new documentary talks about being on The Simple Life and how she was sort of giving the performance of what she thought her character was. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's sort of interesting um, when you get to that. And of course, uh, most people can spot phoniness. And so I would think that would be um, uh, some kind of um, a, a way of protecting it from, from you know, whether the, the people watching said, this person is phony, I don't want to watch them anymore. They're just giving me an act. And then if you look at it too, I think when you mentioned Paris Hilton, wasn't uh, Kim Kardashian, that was her first, she was her assistant at the time on that show, uh, on The Simple Life, right? Was that her first foray yeah, into TV? Organized, yeah. yeah, she organized, she had a closet organizing business and organized Paris's closets. That's right. That's right. I, I remember that. That was, that was classic. Um, yeah, it's um, quite interesting. It, now we're seeing too with the, the parent company of, of Tender, um, the Match Group, um, they just welcomed uh, a new CEO um, and he's formerly a, of CBS Interactive, uh, Jim Lanzone. Um, he laid much of the groundwork in the OTT SVOD space with CBS All Access. Um, and you know, if you look at programs that they had, they had one in particular called Swipe Night that preceded his tenure. Um, it was a choose your own adventure type of series that added um, decisions that were made by the user to their profile and then would match you with like-minded users that made those same kind of decisions. Um, then you look at the recent acquisition um, of the Meek Group by uh, the German media powerhouse Perceben. Um, and then, you know, Warner Media recently installing a new CEO, formerly of Amazon and Hulu. Can you talk about the experience of, of producing shows for different formats, including linear television, Facebook Watch, Snapchat, and what it would take for legacy media to, to fully embrace maybe this next platform of live user-generated content? Yeah, so far it seems like those legacy people, and I, I don't know, are we putting Netflix now and 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 Facebook <laughs> Watch and Amazon into legacy? No, no, um, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> they, but they have not embraced interactive. Um, you know, we did the real world um, many years, and then we did the most recent season on Facebook Watch. And other than doing it in these little, you know, seven minute episodes that would post, um, you know, daily or, or, or four or five times a week. Um, and other than using more graphics and realizing we had to catch people and hook them within those first like minute and a half or we wouldn't keep them. Um, the rules for storytelling weren't that different. Um, you know, and I think we've seen with, for instance, even with Netflix and Amazon and uh, Snap, uh, there hasn't been a big desire to do live. Most of them seem to be more interested in creating, you know, a content library that can then be sold around the world. Um, so I don't know. I think that the, the dating platforms have an opportunity because they're presenting something uh, and they have the technology to present it in a way that uh, I'm not sure those those other folks have. It certainly would would lend itself to the the voyeuristic aspect. I think that's really a a very big central key component to reality television and to um, this this live streaming environment that we're entering into. And um, Amazon is is kind of dabbling in this with uh, with Twitch. They they actually own Twitch and have for a while now, which is the um, live streaming gaming platform. But the fastest growing segment um, on Twitch is indeed their IRL um, or in real life section of Twitch. Um, and, and what makes it so um, engaging is, is the fact that you actually have these virtual gifts that you're giving um, streamers to react in a way um, that really does show immediate appreciation and, and acknowledgement. Um, and that's something I think that, that is, could be very well a, an addition to, to reality programming 
um, as opposed to say watching it after the fact um, and not having that that type of real time engagement. And even with social media, it's the same. You look at it where you're giving someone a like or a comment, and um, and even in dating apps, it's the same. You know, you it may be hours or days before you hear back from someone if you matched with them. So I think that that's really what's a, an advantage to to maybe the live streaming space. And um, I'd be interested to see, you know, if, if is it possible that The Bachelor could be or shows like it in this type of a format um, that could actually be really real and, and live as opposed to, um, you know, pre-produced. Yeah, I mean, there's been, uh, people have been pitching the idea for quite a while now and no one's picked up on it. This idea of um, the viewers somehow having some kind of control or participation, you know, they're, they're, they're deciding who you're gonna date or where you're gonna go or, um, what you're going to reveal about yourself. Um, but so far we haven't seen that happen. Um, there's just been a reluctance to do live, you know, and some of it is these are big companies. And, um, you know, when you go live, you can't control. And most of these larger companies want a lot of control. For sure. Yeah. I think that's an advantage too for, for these apps is that, um, you know, in, in this type of an ecosystem, you, you don't have those type of regulators. Um, you don't have the FCC. Um, you're even more in a, um, in a, a free and, and a freer environment than say even cable would be um, because you don't have those constraints. I think that's, a, that's an advantage. Um, but if that would translate over into the lean back experience, that's always the case, right? The, the handheld versus the lean back living room. Um, TV experience, making that transition has always, it, it's kind of like that we're entering into a, a time where um, you see what the, happened with the record industry um, and the iPhone and, and, and Apple and, and the way that digital you know, music became digital and it really reinvented it. And now, you know, the record industry and the music labels are doing very, very well. Um, but there was a time where the transition was tough. So I think it's that transition that we're, we're finding ourselves in now that I, I would be curious to see if, if there's um, talk of that, or if you have familiarity with that from your point of view that you've seen in the industry? Not really. Um, I, uh, you know, again, I think the dating apps are in a better place to um, innovate what that next form of storytelling might be, um, because you're set, you're set up for it. Uh, if if it's going to involve interaction, if it's going to involve live, um, and certainly you're you're doing it in a lot of ways. There's something the other doing that could work, that gives you some of the same um, experience of watching The Bachelor, or or you know where something is a well told story, uh, but at the same time um, includes that live and includes that interaction. Um, the final question I, I have to ask, um, you know, having essentially invented this format, um, what's been the most rewarding part of your career um, over the decades that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, I think that with the real world, the idea was we wanted to um, show diversity. And um, I think Mary Alice and I were, you know, sort of people who grew up in the 60s and we had this liberal idea that if we get beyond the stereotypes, um, you know, we'll realize that most of us actually have more in common than not in common. So uh, in, you know, the number of LG, LGBTQ um, individuals on the real world and some of the other things we did, we hope we um, uh, broke down some barriers and uh, contributed, you know, to more, um, more open, more positive. And certainly, if you look at the generation that grew up on Real World, they were um, much more open uh, to to the idea of having a gay friend or much more uh, encouraging when they're uh, of their friend to be out and who they were.